Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello, and if there's a single word for start the week to start the year with, then I fear it's probably got to be austerity. And that is indeed our theme today. David Kiniston is one of the stars of modern history whose post-war social history, Austerity Britain, gives him a very useful perspective on our current troubles. Post-war Britain was an artistically vigorous place, of course, the Britain of Henry Moore, Hepworth and Piper. And the sculptor Anthony Gormley is here to talk about one of his latest projects, a collaboration called simply Survivor. Later, we're going to be talking about one radical answer to the longer-term future for our consumer and growth-focused economics. Anna Coote of the New Economics Foundation calls for a much shorter working week of just 21 hours or thereabouts, work less, consume less, live more. We're going to start, though, with perspective in another sense, a country suffering suffering from hurricane winds of austerity with worse to come. Our neighbour, Ireland, has lessons and comparisons galore for Britain, and her leading commentator, Fintan O'Toole, of the Irish Times, is here. Fintan, just set the scene for us, a fifth austerity budget on its way. Uh, yes, we've just had it, actually. Um, and we've just had, as well, our uh, just at the end of the year, we got the sort of exchequer return figures, which tell you something really interesting. Um, exchequer return figures usually aren't terribly interesting. But <laughs> one of the things it told us was that the deficit is going up. <laughs> oh. So we've, we're now on our fifth austerity budget. We're cutting really very deep into social services. It's really basic stuff. We've been huge pay cuts in the public sector. Uh, we've had all that stuff. And we went into last year with a deficit of about 18 billion. We ended it with a deficit of about 25 billion. How does this happen? Well, two things. One is we're putting a huge amount of money into bad banks, which uh, really, for me, raises big questions about what austerity is. But of course, the other is that that the more you cut, the, the more people are unemployed. The, the, yes. the more you're paying out in, in, in welfare payments, the less you're getting in taxation. And uh, I mean, actually... Uh, I suppose to stand back for, for for a second, Ireland feels a bit like the story of the the Dutch story, the boy with the finger in the dike. You know, mm. that's a hoary old tale, where the boy comes along, sees the crack in the dike, and sort of heroically sticks his finger in, while somebody else runs off to get help, and eventually everybody arrives and says, "What a heroic boy! You're mm. absolutely wonderful!" And they fix the dike, and the boy is sort of cheered and is, is told what a good boy he is. The Irish stupidly put their finger in the dike. Uh, which was the euro uh, in 2008 you know the euro was was going to crack uh, the irish banks were the the hole that was there uh, through which the, the 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 sort of tide of 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 disaster, uh, was, disaster was, yeah. was was going to come through we stuck our finger in the dike said okay we will we will pay all this money even though it's all private debt we will pay all the money uh, and we'll stick our finger in the dike and then surely somebody will go and get help and we'll come back and say, oh, you've done a wonderful job, we'll take over now. And of course, we, we still have our finger in the dike yes. and nothing has happened. And you've got, and you've got huge levels of repayment um, to, to deal with after the banking crisis. Yeah, so, so what we've ended up with in Ireland is really the sort of perfect storm, which is you've got vast amounts of private debt, you've vast amounts of, of public debt, uh, and then you, we've taken on all of this uh, mm. banking debt as sovereign debt. So really what you end up with is um, really quite unsustainable levels of debt that nobody really wants to acknowledge. And things are going downwards and downwards in a spiral. Emigration um, is returning to the Irish. Thing. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm 53 now, and uh, this is the second time now in my lifetime that I've lived through the mm. end of Irish emigration, and it's, it's, it's beginning again. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, this is a very deeply entrenched cultural mechanism in Ireland. It goes back 250 years, you, and, and it's, it's the Irish response to hard times is you don't change your society, you change your location. Um, and people, people in England will, have, will already have seen this, particularly in London. You'll, you'll see a lot of young Irish people um, co- com- coming over here. But you, we, we're really at a, at a stage where you've got a thousand, thousand young people a week leaving, uh, going very, to Australia, going to Canada. A very poignant thing in the airport in Dublin, uh, a, a sort of video booth. Just tell us about that. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 this is, it's one of the cliches almost of, of, of Ireland you know, when you grow up is, is that, you know, the Irish television stations used to do these things in the 1960s, you know, the, the poignant scenes at the, well, first of all, it was at the, uh, the, the docks, you know, mm. people going and coming, coming back for Christmas. Um, and now, you know, we're doing all this stuff again. It's just a kind of slightly 
upgraded, you know, which is the, the video booth at the airport of people leaving messages uh, and, and... Reflections on leaving reflections Ireland. Reflections on yeah. leaving Ireland. Um, and, and it's been very interesting in, in many ways because, of course, you've got a very, very plugged-in generation. You know, it's not as if it's not like in the 19th century when they just went and were gone and were treated as they were dead. They're coming back and, and they're they're actually very angry you know they're, they're very angry about the fact that they feel that the place has nothing for them and, and has forced them to leave Fintan what about the politics of this because one of the arguments made by British Eurosceptics of whatever hue is that it's, it's a terribly dangerous thing to hand over economic sovereignty to anybody else because when things turn difficult um, you can't you, you, you have no choices left things are done to you are imposed on you and you, you know, it's, it's almost pointless voting. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a Europhile and mm-hmm. always have been, and I've been very enthusiastic about the European Union and Ireland's place in it. Um, but Ireland is a pretty good case now for for the Eurosceptic, you know, mm. to, be, to be quite honest about it, because all those, all those, all that rhetoric about European values, you know, mm. about solidarity, about notions of of some kind of shared future, yes. of democratic values, all that stuff proves to be very fragile when. Uh, push mm. comes to shove. You know what's really happened in our case is that nobody really gives a damn about democracy. I mean, yeah. really, nobody cares at all about. And, the, about and, the, and this is after you know the modern future of the Irish Republic as the above all the independent republic standing in its own feet, taking its own choices, making its own decisions for itself. Yeah, you know, if, if you consider how much of Irish history, uh, you know, for a very very long time mm. has been tied up with that notion of sovereignty, you know, mm. that notion of of gaining independence, and and how much grief went into it, and how much grief it, it has continued to cause, of course, in the Northern Ireland conflict more more, more recently. Uh, and then you suddenly find a situation where actually it's gone. It's mm. just gone. I mean, it's gone in very real terms, which is, you know, if, if you can't do your own budget, mm. then you're not a sovereign nation. And we had this, the circumstance last November, we discovered accidentally that the Bundestag in Germany was actually debating the Irish budget before the Irish Parliament had even been told what it was or before the Irish cabinet had actually discussed it. It, I mean, it is that stark. And yeah. it's an amazing thing to suddenly discover this. But, I, you know, I, I, I don't look at my television and see great sort of protests across the streets of Dublin or kind of mar- vast angry marches. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a well, it, it it is that very strange kind of boy in the dike uh, situation where you, you you people just feel stuck rather than feeling they're very angry, they're very upset about it, but they feel very powerless and they do, they do feel stuck in in this kind of situation. I mean, obviously, emigration has a huge part to play in this. I mean, mm. the the kids who are sitting in the squares in in Spain, those the equivalents of those kids. Irish kids are in Australia, they're in Canada, they're in London. You know, yes. so so the fact that they go is is a big factor, um, but debt itself is also a huge factor. We we've never had this before. You, you've had people having nothing, but there's something much worse actually than having nothing, which we've discovered, which is having mountains of debt. Yes. So the, the, so as well so, as all this public debt, this private debt that people have that they're just desperately trying to service, makes it very difficult for people. So to people protest. are scared above all. Really scared. Really and, scared. And, and and very angry, but also just that it's at the moment we've just got that that sense of powerlessness, and it feeds into the whole democratic challenge. You know, the, the challenge of giving people back a sense of power, and this, by the way, is 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 coming to a cinema near you. You know, it's, it's, this isn't just an Irish problem. If you look at what's happened in Italy, if you look at what's happened in Greece, where, where mm. you know, elected governments, whatever, whoever you, whether you like them or not, have been basically brushed aside. You look at what's happening in Hungary, where you're getting a new kind of authoritarian Absolutely, uh, yeah. sense. You know, there is a democratic crisis. And, and I think what's, what's happened, the Irish have really been the forerunners of this. We turned a banking crisis into a sovereign debt crisis and then turned the sovereign debt crisis into a democratic crisis. And that's exactly what's happening everywhere through Europe. So the banking crisis is morphing and now it's reaching the point of being a crisis of democracy itself. Anna Coote. Yes, I was just wondering, you, you talked about the boy sticking his finger in the dike. What about the story of the emperor's new clothes? I mean, I wondered if there was anywhere in Ireland where um, there were people who were saying, actually, it doesn't have to be this way. Is there a is there a, uh, is there any optimism there? Because it's a terrible story, but where's the optimism and where does it come from? And if it's not there, why isn't it there? Yeah, well, some of us keep shouting that the emperor doesn't have any clothes, you know, and that uh, well, apart from anything else, saying look, this is just a new form of self delusion. You know, we, we got into the problem in the first place because we were deluded on this sort of cocaine of of finance capitalism. You know, that we, if you you could people were you know you could buy and sell houses and you could do all this sort of stuff and you talk to taxi drivers who were buying apartments in the Cape Verde Islands even though they didn't know where the Cape Verde Islands were. You 
you know, we, we had all that, but there's a new form of self-delusion, which is actually, if you take all this pain, it will be okay. And it feeds into almost a kind of Catholic guilt thing as well, mm. at, at mm. some level, you know, that, mm. that, that, that actually we deserve to be punished. But the optimism really comes from the fact that, that, that is de- it is delusional, you know, that it actually won't work and it can't work and it actually and, is not sustainable. And, and, and David Kiniston, is this, is, is this a, I mean, there are lessons and warnings here uh, yeah, I think the rest you, of us one, too, one, one area is the whole question of politics, uh, democratic politics in relation to, to the financial system, to the banks. I mean, was there any debate when that fateful decision was taken? Is there debate now about what, with these first repayments coming and more down the road, wh- whether they're going to be made or not? I mean, what's what's the state of play? Yeah, I suppose, j- j- just to remind people, um, the, the, the Irish bank bailout is the most expensive yeah. proportionally in the history of the world. Yeah. Billion, we're basically billion. putting yeah so so if you put in all all the stuff there's somewhere between 100 and 110 yes. billion which might not sound like an awful lot in the UK but if you imagine it was Manchester doing it right so so basically Ireland is Greater Manchester mm-hmm. so if you can imagine Greater Manchester putting in 100 billion into its banks two of which are completely dead so it's not even as if you're keeping institutions going so so the, gone, the, the, yeah. the the worst uh, offenders are actually gone and we're still paying the money so i think this is what it's what protest will cohere around because the bill starts to come due for a lot of this in, in the end at the end of March and I think that's where people will say hold on a minute you mean all the money we're taking out in austerity budgets we're putting it the same amount of money into dead banks and I think at some point the penny or the, the, the hundred billion <laughs> euro, euro drops is going and to people realise you can't do it. Phil and where is the, the, the voice of the youth as it were where is the, the possess the streets where, where where's the kind of Wall Street reaction where, where, are the, where are the students from Trinity College who are saying why are we doing this yeah well I, I i talked to a lot of them really and and uh there there is an occupy movement you know and and it is getting they've sort of endured through the winter which is is tough enough you know they're they're out on the streets uh and they are beginning to do some uh creative and interesting things i think you know so so it's gone from the phase of just occupying and sitting there in front of the irish central bank to beginning to occupy buildings for example because one of the things that's happened is that the irish state has taken over these you know this vast property empire the the, the irish state is, is now has the biggest property portfolio in the world because it took over all the all the rubbish that was bought by the property developers. So what people are beginning to do now is to actually occupy buildings, turn them into useful things, or you know. So there is there is the beginning of youth movements. Uh, I think emigration though does play a big factor in in, in all of this. You know, if, if people are going to leave, you don't get that energy. But I, do, I I would say that by the end of the year, you will see actually very coherent uh, youth well, protest movements. An Irish spring is on the way. Um, before we get to, to, to spring, however, let's return to winter. Mm-hmm. Uh, a bit of historical perspective with David Kiniston, whose Social History of Britain, 1945 onwards, of course, um, focuses on those uh, iconic sort of austerity years. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just start. We think we know what austerity is at the moment, David, <laughs> but it was a whole different kind of austerity back then. No, I, I think that's right. That was slightly brought home to me, I think it was last autumn, when the... Um, Chief Executive of Sainsbury's was being interviewed with their latest results and so on, and he was asked about trends in shop, shopping habits and so on. And he says, "Yes, things you know, the, the, the tough times are starting to grip. We've noticed this. Uh, the number of items in the weekly shopping trolley have gone down from, I think he said, forty-four to forty-three. And it did strike me that forty-three, mm. you know, they, quite they, a should, lot. they should be so lucky, as it were. I mean, uh, uh, it, uh, utterly different times, I think, uh, um, in, in all sorts of ways, both in a material sense and a psychological sense." You quote Doris Lessing the novelist yeah, coming yeah. coming from Africa, yeah, exactly. sunlit Africa, yeah. and describing. Yeah. And she came. This was four years after the war. She came, I think, for nineteen forty nine, and she was just struck by the general shabbiness, and no one apparently had any money. And, and there's no doubt that in that immediate period after the war, it was the middle class who took the greater hit. It was certainly the middle class who grumbled like mad about things. And and in terms of the politics, the 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 equality agenda, as it were, there was there were there were very very few fat cats in 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 the nineteen forties and fifties. Yeah, 50s. That, that's right. There was I mean very high uh, ta- taxation. Uh, savings had been pretty much uh, decimated, um, and mm, as importantly, um, there was an egalitarian ethos in the air. I mean, it was a remarkable period, that immediate post-war period with the Attlee government, and one can be revisionist about it and so on. But the fact is that in very difficult economic circumstances, um, that uh, government created a, a silent peacetime revolution with the coming of the welfare state. So there was 
you know, there was hope, there was a feel-good factor, and I think it made a big difference. I don't want everyone listening to this programme to go off and slit their wrists, but, I mean, there was an optimism around at the time, well, which there isn't the, now. The, it was a or political more, optimism. Uh, yeah, there, there was a degree of optimism around. I mean, they were difficult times. There was a huge amount of grumbling. There was a great amount of sort of physical, and psychological weariness, I think. I mean, people at the end of the war had not expected the degree of austerity that was about to hit them. They had imagined that actually things were pretty quickly going to, going to improve. So it was an, those closing months of 1945 were, were a nasty surprise. And before we bash consumerism, of course, people were desperate for consumerism at the time, the British Housewives League, and people were campaigning vigorously for more stuff. De- de- definitely. And, and what often strikes me about my, I suppose, about my parents' generation, who were, you know, saying that their 20s during the 1940s. But uh, once the consumer goods started to come through, the white goods, the, the fridges, the washing machines and so on, from the late 50s, early 60s, uh, they, they took them with, you know, they greeted them with open arms and mm. so on, while at the same time uh, maintaining their sort of formative habits, uh, and you know, and even e- 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 even now, there's always this problem of getting an elderly parent to respect the sell-by date and so on, which I think we're all, you know, of a certain generation familiar with. Absolutely, um, and and also d- during this period, rationing, of course, is still there. Um, but there's a, a very interesting change in people's attitudes to, for instance, spivs and people getting round yeah, rationing. It yeah, becomes more and more acceptable. Ter- terribly symptomatic, I think, in those early years after the war. However much there, there was grumbling and so on, there was an acceptance that there was a need for austerity, for rationing and so on. And this was part of the price to be paid for having fought uh, an honourable, just, good war and so on. By about 1948, certainly 49, people just started to get fed up. The point of it started to uh, uh, elude them. And the figure of the spiv embodying the black market, of course, uh, who had been demonised, the SPIV, by about 1949 started to become a rather sort of um, looked at with some warmth. And there was a particular comedian called Arthur English, known as the Prince of the Wide Boys, and his shoulder pads and mm. kipper ties and so on. And he became a you know, popular radio comedian and so on from <laughs> about 1949. So attitudes changed. And, of course, that was ultimately what did for that Attlee government uh, was that the Tories were seen as more likely to end austerity more quickly, which I think was a reasonable reasonable assessment. I, w- I wonder if part of the moral is, is that word austerity, which has a certain sort of grave nobility about it. It means yes. a lot more than poverty or shabbiness. It's, you know, austere, we quite like austere, yes. but we don't want it for too long. It's a word with a, with the, t- that is time limited. It has a sell-by date itself. Yeah, and certainly that's, that sell-by date had, had gone off a few years after the war. But I, I, I like the word austerity because it suggests that there is a common goal. We are disciplining our ourselves in order to achieve something and I, I, I mean I, I take this sort of rising consumerism that you say comes in around 1950 but I think that there was a, I mean certainly from my parents generation I get the sense that there was a collective wish to rebuild Britain and I think out of that came I think Rab's you know, education reforms which were so critical to what we what I was able to enjoy as a student later The, 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 the thing about Austerity is that it, it, it is a very noble notion and it actually is an ethic. Uh, and I think this is what's being missed at the moment in the misuse of the word. What we're getting at the moment around Europe is not austerity. You know, it's parallel universe theory. You know, it's, it's, it's vast amounts of, 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 of resources going into one particular part of the economy and society and then austerity for, for other people. The point about post-war austerity for all its limitations was that it implied a, an equality of pain and a quality of suffering. But also it implied that there was something at the end of it. It was an ethical word, not simply an economic word. Precisely. It, mm. it, it had an ethic, but it also had, as Anthony said, it had a goal. And it is remarkable to look back. And, you know, for all the, 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 the limitations, and, 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 you know, David's wonderful work brings out all the kind of complexity of it. But the fact is, it, it was tolerable because it was going somewhere. And I think what we've got at the moment is nobody is articulating for the public across the developed world where this might be going. What are the aims? What kind of society do we want? Well, we come, we come back to the missing politics that you were describing earlier, Fintan. Anna? I mean, if you're comparing the two eras, one mm. of the main differences is that they could anticipate economic growth without there being any obvious problems about it. Yeah. And it was something that was a given. And now, if we anticipate uh, return to business as usual, which far too many people do, um, we have all the problems that are, so- that are associated with environmental damage and climate change and so on. So it's not a simple, we're here and we need to go there and that's fine. This is the route we're on. We have more p- complex problems now. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. 
Anthony, I, Anthony Gormley. I, I think that we feel, I mean, I certainly feel that in some way the general public are being asked to pay for the sins of, of, of people who are out of control. And, and, and we are going back. I mean, it's, it's as if, oh, well, you know, the ship will right itself. But we need a radically new ship. Where is the new financial model? But, but, but don't we return also to the, the dilemma that we're discussing in regard to Ireland? Is on, on the one hand, uh, countries have given up their economic sovereignty and, yeah. and populations are unable to vote. On the other hand, when you're looking at the sort of superclass, the very, very wealthy, um, they can skip from country to country. So you need a certain amount of uh, extraterritorial yeah. authority. And, and, and we're in a globalised world of competitive economies, and yeah. it's a real problem. And if you take the city of London and the question of how that's regulated... Whose history it's, you it's, wrote. It, but it is a, yeah. it is a, it is a real, real, real problem, because this, this, London as an international financial centre is in competition with other international financial centres. Um, and and I th well, we'll be coming to 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 to, to, uh, to Anna later in the discussion. But I think there's a problem there as well on international competitiveness. Right. Part of the issue, though, is that that what you got after the war uh, with that Attlee government, which I think is one of the great institutions, and I can say this as an Irish person, I say, mm. I'm not sort of politically involved in it, but you know, it is an ex astonishing institution. And I think you can kind of see this because uh, actually Ireland is interesting because about half a million people from the Republic of Ireland emigrated to England during austerity. <laughs> mm. Why did they go? They had plenty of food in Ireland. You know, there was loads of food. They had housing. They were okay. Mm. What they emigrated to was social democracy. You know, mm. well, uh, and, I, and I know and, this. And jobs. It was work and, but also opportunity. You know, yeah, it was that sure. sense that actually, sure. okay, you might have to work very hard. It might be tough, but your kids would have a better life than you would have. And, and I know this because most of my father's family, most of my mother's family did that. And it meant a huge amount to them that they could get education, that their kids could get education, that they would have a health service. And, these are the things that we're simply not talking about anymore. Well, how, know, how, I wonder how many, we're, we're both in our 50s, I wonder how many people of, of our age would, would say to our children, you're going to have a better life than we've had. Not many, I suspect. I want to, I, I want to move on to Anthony Gormley uh, now, um, because one of, I mean, one of the, the, the facets of the optimism of the 1940s was um, public art, public sculpture. Um, it, was, it was a culturally rather rich time, um, for sculpture and for uh, and for other artworks. Yeah, Festival Anthony. of Britain, an extraordinary moment, I mm. think, an mm. extraordinary moment of celebration of both art and science and technology. And, and I think that fed into this notion of rebuilding a nation and looking about, I mean, uh, ways in which a nation could be self-reflexive as well as forward-looking. Yes. Um, and barely, think, barely a public space without a Henry Moore or a Hemworth, it seems, yes. looking back at that time. Yes, and um, now they're being um, nicked for scrap. But anyway, the, I mean, I think that we are at, at a totally different time. And I think that we do feel, I mean, I, I guess this piece that I'm making with Hove Schechter at the Barbican is called Survivor because I think that's what we're doing at the moment. We feel that we are at sea in systems that we cannot personally either contribute to or... or um, be anything other than a victim of. And in a sense, the, the word survivor suggests that there, there is no heroes anymore. We are, we are simply subject to forces that are either humanly made or natural, or in the case of some tsunamis, we might say a combination of both because of the anthropic uh, kind mm -hmm. of effect on climate change. And I guess, you know, for me, I guess... Out of out of the experience of making this work, I realise that there are other forms of capital, and I would say that you know yesterday I was at the Barbican. There were 150 volunteers on the stage yes, who just, are all just, just helping us make this spectacle. Describe is, for us a little bit of what Survivor is is going to it's, look and it's, feel it's like. It's essentially Hoffe Schechter's extraordinary music. There is a full orchestra with a wonderful strings section. Mm -hmm. And there are moments when our attention is held by the single string of a cello. And other moments where there are uh, literally 170 musicians on stage and we are swept up in a storm of mm. music. And, and what, I think what, what is the role of a sculptor in this? Anthony? Well, it's interesting because Hoffe has been very generous. Um, I, I didn't want to fill the fill the stage with things I, I'm, I'm very interested in the body in space and I think I've been invited to think about um, the body in the time of music as its space and uh, together we have made this structure and it's a temporal one rather than a physical one that I hope is a kind of place where all of us can sense our own involvement in this I guess sea of emotions and, and, and I I'm interested in deconstructing the spectacle, so there are moments when the house lights are on, 
when actually the audience is itself being represented at, at great scale on a huge screen. There's a screen that is 14 metres wide and 8 metres high that takes a 4-5 image, and there is a moment within the drama um, where Jason comes out with a night vision camera and begins to look at the people that are looking. And we don't know quite how this is going to go. It's a very experimental work, it has yeah. to be said. Yeah. Um, but what I, what I was so excited about yesterday was just this feeling that, you know, the, the, the schools are Morpeth, Morpeth School, a, a, a school with 50% Bangladeshi um, students. You, you're bringing in lots of school kids to be part of the drumming, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, and, and they may not share a common language, but certainly when it comes to rhythm, the things that, that, that they do collectively, and, and, and indeed the feeling of energy and potential I mean, it, it, for me, very, very inspiring. This is about people doing things together for the sake of doing them, for the feeling that that gives them one to the other and the sense of being part of something that is not essential, that is not a product, that is not, strictly speaking, necessary, but makes you feel alive, makes you feel potential. You, your, your work, your art, uh, above all, takes place in public spaces. It's sort of people surround it. It's it's, it's on the, it's on the uh, roofscapes of uh, of cities or in public spaces and beaches and so on. What do you think the opportunities are when we're going through tough times for artists? Because you know there has been a period where art became just another part of consumption. It was something that had a a market value which shot up. People invested in. Um, you know, all the big galleries have hugely wealthy sort of health he hedge fund uh, um, supporters and so on. Yeah, I think I think we 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 stood by and watched the privatisation and the specialisation of art. I think this is a time where we've really got to question that. I think that art, uh, or anyway, the creative side of human beings is homo. We are homo faber after all. We all make things. I think we need to make more things. We need to realise that actually making things together is a good. And it's a very powerful good. And, uh, yeah, f for me, uh, in a way, you could say the whole period of modernity where, 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 in a way, particularly sculptors, Brancusi, for example, disappears within his own studio in order to remake the world on his own terms. And curiously, the art of the 20th century didn't, didn't produce very much in terms of imaginative furniture in the collective spaces of our cities. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I hope that the 21st century will return to an anthropological model of what art is. It's a place where people can find identity, can create a sense of self together. And, and and share those products in a, in in a collective way. And it isn't about you know the trophy. It isn't about the corporation you know getting their Henry Moore and put, sticking up in front of their, mm. their 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 corporate headquarters. It's actually about asking how how can we enrich, give an extra dimension to the to the spaces that have been so occupied, I think, and 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 privatized by corporate and advertising. Uh, and make them again collectively Re reclaim over. public space absolutely for the imagination yes and 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 for some sort of redemptive or higher role which is something that would have got a a snort and a hoot of derision um, when it comes to art over the Let's last not decade let's say or two. higher role i think to ask pertinent questions about who we are where we're going and what we believe in in other words, just that opening. Uh, you know, it's, I, I think it's really fascinating to have this conversation because we've been talking about democracy, you know, and, and the crisis of democracy. And there, there, I think there are two, two elements of this that, that art feeds into, I think. I think one is just at a very simple level, um, who in our societies do people still have any kind of trust in or, you know, who are people who look to any kind of collective culture that has some sort of integrity? Um, you know, everything has failed us. Every kind of institution has let us down. Churches, again, in Ireland, we've got a particular example of this, banks, politicians, uh, artists in general, although some of them have been up their own uh, fundaments, but th there, there has been an element, uh, at least, of, of integrity to the arts. And... I think that gives artists an incredible position in contemporary society because we're looking for something. But there's also the sense, and I think Anthony in his work is a great Democrat, you know, and because it has a fundamental belief in the notion that individual artistic 
effort feeds into a collective identity and helps to define a collective identity. And you've got to almost begin again, it seems to me, with that very simple notion of what is our collective identity. Mm. And if you, if you can start with that, you can rebuild democracy. But if you don't have it, you're really nowhere. Yeah. But let's make yeah. things that uh, invite that question. Yes, you said right at the beginning that you didn't think it was strictly necessary what you were doing. So maybe what we need to be doing is redefining what is necessary, because if what you're doing is helping to create a sort of creative solidarity that will enable us to find our way out of this mess, then I'd say it's entirely necessary. And one of the problems we've got is this these sort of accepted wisdom about what is important and what necessary and what isn't. Yeah, on, on this sort of privatisation of art uh, and the relation of that to modernity, I, I think you're really onto something. Uh, and Compare Joyce and Dickens. Joyce, silence, exile, and cunning, uh, and no conception of the public role of the artist. Uh, Dickens, huge enthusiasm at the moment for Dickens, the, the publicly engaged writer, close relationship with his audience, apart obviously from being a great writer and the great imagination and so on. And I just wonder whether maybe in literature some kind of swing might might go back. In, in to, to those too. great 19th century well, it, masters. Can I, can I just put in a word for Joyce? He did say he wanted to create the, the <laughs> Sorry, uncreated yeah. watch, conscience of his race. Watch uh, yourself, you know. Kinnister. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and actually, I mean, he, he, he is a great Democrat yeah, as yeah. well, you know. Uh, um, he, he creates the notion of, of, yeah, yeah, of sure public space and, 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 and the day of the city. Sure, yeah, I, I yeah, take well, that point. I mean, it, 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 in terms of the plastic arts, I have to say it would be wonderful to go through a period where um, our, I was at the Venice Biennale last time, and it's all, it's quotation about quotation about quotation about quotation. It's it's so sort of uh, inward looking, and um, but I think that's what's happened with art. You know, art it's about art, self-referential is art now. Yeah, and I think art should be about time, something else. Well, it should be about life. <laughs> I mean, it should be about yeah, life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Anaku, let's let, let's turn to some. Um, we, we've been talking about lots of problems and a few answers, but let's talk to uh, about the answer that um, the New Economics Foundation and yourself have been. Uh, looking at, which is a radical one, which is simply that we should all work far less in terms of the number of hours. And you propose, because it works out at the kind of average, a 21-hour working week, which compares with the sort of 40-odd uh, working week that is, is characteristic in this country. Yes, well, I mean, um, we we propose that we move gradually towards a much shorter and more flexible amount of paid working hours for people because of course lots of people work without pay mm. particularly women in the home so what we're saying is we want to um, encourage people to think about shortening the number of hours we spend on average in paid work so that we can redistribute paid and unpaid time um, and there are lots of reasons for this one is that it would help to distribute a diminishing amount of paid employment so there'd be fewer people unemployed and the could help to cut the benefits bill. I mean, that's the most obvious immediate reason. Then you've got the whole thing about getting people off the consumer treadmill. So we're not just living to work and working to earn and earning to consume and then consuming, uh, you know, in ways that damage our mm. natural environment. So there's that argument as well. And it all comes back again to a, a, an older slightly older argument about the need to get a better work life balance. I mean, mm. what are we here for? We need more time for our children and our friends and we need time now to be active citizens and we need time to do to, and, to, to reflect on life and do the sorts of things that Andy is talking about and before people um, think well this is all terribly airy fairy and it couldn't possibly happen you've got some examples in the report where in fact the working week has been radically shortened for, for reasons of crisis I mean the three day working week uh, under the Heath government is one of the examples you yes and, and actually people were quite surprised afterwards when they looked to see whether what had happened to productivity and, and it's well known now that if you work short hours you tend to be more productive hour for hour so there was that example and there are think, examples out, out, output fell by only six percent yes, during working yes it was so, so um so there, there's that but and also you look to other european countries i mean the countries that have got the shorter working week and the um, more flexible working time tend to have lower unemployment and better growth mm. um, so there's no real reason why we shouldn't do things differently However, I mean, the tough side of this has to be lower incomes too. You can't, you can't have shorter working weeks um, uh, and consume less without there being a drop in income. There would be an increase in income for people who've got no income at the moment, sure. so there's that. But at the same time, um, part of our argument is that we need to reconsider how much is enough. How much money do people need? 
do we really need to buy that thing that everybody else is buying? Can that's we That's the get basis of our that? entire economy, Anna. <laughs> this absolutely moment, isn't right. It? And look where we are with our economy being on that basis. So we need to change the basis of the economy in order to get to a sustainable future future because at the moment the economy isn't run in a way that we can possibly sustain for future generations so if we want to safeguard the future for our um, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren we're going to need to think differently about how we consume so that comes back to um, it, when people say you can't work shorter hours because it means a drop in income we say well actually how much money do we need and so how do you start to 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 uh, work on this this is this is so ra- this is the anti westfield agenda it's about as radical as it can be imagined um, and almost all politicians are going to run a mile um, from standing up in public and saying we're going to consume less we're going to have less um, we're going to work less. This is just so far away from the political conversation going on at the moment. How do you start to, to make the argument? Yes, well, I mean, that's the job of an organisation like the New Economics Foundation is to start to open up the argument and to try and change the climate of opinion. We brought out a report last year that identified some of the practical problems. And now we've got this conference and seminar this week at the LSE that we're, where we're bringing together people who have expertise in the different areas to see if we can address some of those practical problems like what to do about low wages mm. what it, and also to gather the evidence. So there's a, a growing body of evidence that suggests that people who uh, work shorter hours have a smaller carbon footprint. So we're gathering the evidence to build up the argument and to try and get people in to try and to address some of the practical problems. Well, apart from the absolute horror for people like me of having time to stop and address my inner self, um, you're making some interesting arguments there. How do the rest of us react? Well, look, it, I, I, I think this is a really timely report and, and, and at least the questions that are being asked are exactly the right questions. If you just look at the state that we're in and how we've got here, uh, you know, one of the ways we've got here is this huge con job that's been done on ordinary people, which is the, the abolition of the 40-hour week. I mean, David knows this better than anybody else, but I mean, the, the, the history of working people trying to get control of some of their own time, you know, is one of the noblest struggles in, in human history and was a successful one. You know, people actually did manage to get a 40-hour week uh, and it's gone. It's gone for almost everybody and particularly for those at the bottom. You know, the images we always get are of the, you know, the, the, the vastly overworked multi, multi-billionaire, you know, master of the universe. But actually, you find people at the bottom who are working two and three jobs. If you look at the, the, what's happening in the United States in particular. Contract cleaners. I mean, a really appalling. Uh, and, but also people in the middle who are the, the, the idea of home has, has been destroyed by you know, the, the, the Blackberry by email, by the sense that you, you are never on your own, you're never not at work. You, when you're asleep, perhaps you're allowed not to be at work. So this, this whole question of how did it happen to us that actually the vast majority of people won something really important and it's been taken away from them. Anthony Gormley. I, I just feel we've got to reconsider uh, this word economy and bring into, bring into mind the fact that there are... We have assumptions that somehow air that water, uh, the right to light, um, that those are in some way free. Well, they're not. They're all limited resources. I think that we, we have been forced into a position of being dumb consumers, but we're not. We're all intelligent, creative potential you know makers of a of a shared world and i think i think this idea of a larger economy is the thing that we've got to start with we we seem to be we we seem to only have a kind of keynesian or a or a or a, or a, an idea of a kind of developmental progressive western model of a fiscal yes. economy well part of our argument is that we have to value what we call the core economy and that's the uncommodified unpaid economy where people are doing unpaid work in the home and they're doing creative work out of the home and so on and um, if, if, if we value that differently and you organise policies in order to help it to flourish you have a whole different take on what it means to think about the economy. But, but David Kinnison isn't, isn't the, the lesson from the 1940s and 1950s that people do desperately want to consume. They want more stuff. I mean, this 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 sounds very attractive and, yeah. and noble, yeah. but actually, what people want is yeah. they want more money and they want more stuff. Uh, yeah, and and has that has that changed? I mean, surely, if anything, from the eighties onwards, c- consumerism in- intensified in all sorts of ways. Strong evidence that uh, people are beyond us, uh, above a certain level, mm. um, being better off doesn't make you any what, happier. What, what sort of level things do that don't make well, you happy? Do no. They? It's the relationships, it's uh, the, the, what, the, whether you've got control over your time matters. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I it would tend to. I, I, thing, I from, suppose. I mean, b- b- personal point of view, I would tend to agree, agree, agree with with both of you on that. Uh, but I see no compelling evidence that people at large have abandoned, as it were, the consumerist dream. I mean, I was st- when Westfield um, opened the one in the, yeah. the, the Shepherd's Bush one. It opened just as the you know the the, the proverbial was hitting the fan in about oh nine, wasn't it? Oh eight, oh nine, right. and people said, "What you know? Could there be worse timing?" turned out to be a roaring success. Uh, hitting the fan again in 2011, the one opens in Stratford, again, a roaring success. But isn't you have to start proof? somewhere, don't you? you, you it, just because people like going shopping or people think that the only thing that they've got left to do with their spare time is to shop... Mm. It's the major sort of leisure activity. It mm. doesn't mean you can't do things differently and gradually um, create a climate it, it, of opinion that mm. would yeah, yeah, no, 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 sure. And, and you know, the, the debate should go on and, and so on. But we are assuming we know better. But the success of Westfield is surely proof um, that we've been brainwashed, that we, well, that we think that we need things that um, we don't uh, actually but, need. The, the old Marxist phrase, false consciousness, is almost... But you've yeah. got the problem also about the effect of all this consumption on the environment. Yeah, um, yeah, huge uh, potential there's some terrific, for catastrophic damage. There's some terrifically damage. good arguments, Anna, but... but, but, but we that can't, isn't just assuming we, we know we, better but, than other people. That's, just, uh, that's, that's see, the sh- evidence. Sh- surely the, the point, the it, 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 what makes this real, is uh, not an abstract argument, is we simply can't go on as we've been going. You know, it, it, it's not as if this is an argument about whether this is a good thing or a bad mm. thing or whether we're all sort of nice middle class people mm. telling, telling working people they shouldn't be shopping. It's, you know, we have an unsustainable economic model which has been turbocharged since the 1980s and which has brought us to a kind of catastrophe. You know, what we're talking about is civilization. I mean, that, that very word is really in, in threat. I mean, what's happening in Ireland at the moment is, you know, that, that children with learning difficulties, for example, cannot get any help. Now, when you're at that point, your civilization is in trouble. Your democracy is in trouble. Something has to change and it has to be pretty fundamental. Well, there is a rousing way to finish. The best start of the week is always the ones where you want to talk for another 40 odd minutes uh, and keep going. Thank you to all my guests. That was very stimulating. Fintan O'Toole of the Irish Times, David Kinniston's third volume in his post war social history, Modernity Britain, is going to be published in the autumn if we give him enough time away from the studio to write it. And Akut will be chairing a discussion about time, covering all those issues at the LSE on Wednesday. And Anthony Gormley's Survivor is on at the Barbican later this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about the cause of today's austerity, the financial crisis, and whether money is actually worth anything anymore with Detlef Schlichter, Philip Coggan and Angela Knight. But for now, thank you and goodbye. If you've enjoyed this BBC podcast, why not try some others, such as The Forum, the discussion programme about global ideas. And to find out more, visit bbcworldservice.com forward slash forum. Foundation calls for a much shorter working week of just 21 hours or thereabouts, work less, consume less, live more. We're going to start, though, with perspective in another sense, a country suffering suffering from hurricane winds of austerity with worse to come. Our neighbour, Ireland, has lessons and comparisons galore for Britain, and her leading commentator, Fintan O'Toole of the Irish Times, is here. Fintan, just set the scene for us. A fifth austerity budget on its way. Uh, yes, we've just had it, actually. Um, and we've just had, as well, our uh, just at the end of the year, we got the sort of exchequer return figures, which tell you something really interesting. Um, exchequer return figures usually aren't terribly interesting. But <laughs> one of the things it told us was that the deficit is going up. <laughs> oh. So we've, we're now on our fifth austerity budget. Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello, and if there's a single word for start the week to start the year with, then I fear it's probably got to be austerity. And that is indeed our theme today. David Kiniston is one of the stars of modern history whose post-war social history, Austerity Britain, gives him a very useful perspective on our current troubles. Post-war Britain was an artistically vigorous place, of course, the Britain of Henry Moore, Hepworth and Piper, and the sculptor Anthony Gormley is here to talk about one of his latest projects, a collaboration called simply Survivor. Later, we're going to be talking about one radical answer to the longer-term future for our consumer and growth-focused economics, Anna Coote of the New Economics Fund. While somebody else runs off to get help and eventually everybody arrives and says, what a heroic boy, you're mm-hmm. absolutely wonderful, and they fix the dike and the boy is sort of cheered and is, is told what a good boy he is. 
the Irish stupidly put their finger in the dike, uh, which was the euro. Uh, in 2008, you know, the euro was, was going to crack. Uh, the Irish banks were the, the hole that was there uh, through which the, 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 the sort of tide of, of, of disaster, uh, was, disaster was, yeah. was going to come through. We stuck our finger in the dike and said, OK, we will, we will pay all this money, even though it's all private debt. We will pay all the money uh, and we'll stick our finger in the dike and then surely somebody will go and get help and we'll come back and say, oh, you've done a wonderful job. We'll take over now. And of course, we, we still have our finger in the dike yes. and nothing has happened. And you've got, and you've got huge levels of repayment um, to, to deal with after the banking crisis. Yeah, so, so what we've ended up with in Ireland is really the sort of perfect storm, which is you've got vast amounts of private debt, you've vast amounts of, of public debt, uh, and then you, we've taken on all of this uh, mm. banking debt as sovereign debt. So really what you end up with is um, really quite unsustainable levels of debt that nobody really wants to acknowledge. And things are going downwards and downwards in a spiral. Emigration um, is returning to the Irish. Scene. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm 53 now, and uh, this is the second time now in my lifetime that I've lived through the mm. end of Irish emigration, and it's, it's, it's beginning again. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, this is a very deeply entrenched cultural mechanism in Ireland. It goes back 250 years, you, and, and it's, it's the Irish response to hard times is you don't change your society, you change your location. Uh, we're cutting really very deep into social services, into really basic stuff. We've been huge pay cuts in the public sector. Uh, we've had all that stuff. And we went into last year with a deficit of about 18 billion. We ended it with a deficit of about 25 billion. How does this happen? Well, two things. One is we're putting a huge amount of money into bad banks, which uh, really, for me, raises big questions about what austerity is. But of course, the other is that, that the more you cut, the, the more people are unemployed. The, the, yes. the more you're paying out in, in, in welfare payments, the less you're getting in taxation. And uh, I mean, actually, uh, I suppose to stand back for, for, for a second, Ireland feels a bit like the story of the, the Dutch story, the boy with the finger in the dike. You know, mm. That's a hurry old tale where the boy comes along, sees the crack in the dike and sort of heroically sticks his finger 